Thank you so much. I, I, I want to thank you so much for, for all your kind hospitality. I want to especially thank Doris for inviting me and, and for making it possible for me to be here and, and share time with you and, and to share these discussions. What I'd like to do in the generous amount of time uh, that I've been allotted this morning is to, to sort of break it up into two parts as, as uh, is listed. Um, with this first part, I'd like to uh, answer or at least offer some answers to the big question of how did humanity evolve from the perspective of evolutionary anthropology. Um, and this is a perspective that is often misrepresented in public and poorly understood uh, across multiple disciplines. What I'd like to do is update you, and I'll give you a little summary as to what that update is going to involve for this first 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes, then have a little time for a br brief discussion, then a break, then come back and take two areas of topical interest of my own research uh, that are particularly, I think, potentially relevant uh, of interest to this group. Um, and those two brief topics that will happen in the second part after the break will be a little, a brief glimpse at what understanding of human biology tells us about what race is and what it is not. And then also a little bit into this interesting area on the evolution of religion. So I'm going to throw myself into the fire here. Uh, <laughs> Just to show that there's some interesting dialogue in anthropology that needs uh, engagement with theological perspectives and philosophical and theological I ideas and discourse. Uh, and I'd like to lay those two things out as sort of the second half. But in this first half, I'd like to uh, really ask the question, uh, how did humanity evolve? And, and give you an idea of the kinds of data of deep time uh, that we engage in as anthropologists uh, with the notion uh, that I think, at least from my last five or six years of interacting uh, intensively and intellectually in a generous manner with theologians, that there's also something of interest for theology here. So um, I, we can start, and I apologize that the, the screen is small. I should have made the words, uh, letters larger, but I'll read off what's important. And in the subsequent video that will be accessible to everyone, the actual slides will be in there so you can see them and all of that. And I'll make these available uh, to Brian, who'll make them available to anyone who, who would like them. When we think about humans and evolutionary continuity, humans as part of the world, the biological and natural world here, uh, we tend to think of, well, humans have uh, you know, birth, they give birth to life young with extended deep childhoods. We have these big complex brains and we have complex social lives. Um, we could start there, and that's where many people do in talking about humans, but that doesn't actually give us humans. I mean, gorillas have these same things as do blue whales. Um, so these traits that we often associate with what makes us human actually are shared much more broadly, are part of this incredible evolutionary continuity, this connection to the world. Uh, for humans, actually, uh, what, what I find particularly interesting, and again, you can't see these extremely well, but if we look around ourselves today at our great religious organizations, institutions, and histories, at the nation states that we have, at the incredible cities and environments and connections and politics and landscapes, that is distinctive. Right? That is not found in anything else. And we can go back a little bit in time, as, as many people, uh, particularly historians, are wont to do, two or three, four thousand years to find some of the origins of, of our current uh, city-states and, and cultures and contexts. We can even go back a little bit further, as some people do, uh, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20,000 years ago to see the transition from foraging peoples to sedentary towns and urban life. Um, but what I'd like to point out, the kind of work that I do and where I'm really interested in the human story um, is really a little deeper because all the stuff I just mentioned is just at the last few seconds of human existence. And I'm actually particularly interested not just what happened 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. I'm interested in what happened 200,000 years ago, half a million years ago, two million years ago which is still part of the human story. And we have an enormous amount of data that can enrich this discussion. And this is not something that most people think about. Two million years is a rather strange concept. But I'd like to walk you through a little bit of that information to situate us, to help us think through what it means to be human in a broad, scientifically informed way, and show you how much this resonates with the need for a broader and a more expansive engagement when thinking about the human. All right, um, so I'm going to give a super brief approach to hominin evolution. I'm going to provide you with two views of human nature, both of which you'll be familiar with, uh, and try to convince you that one is wrong and another one is right. Uh, and uh, to do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about contemporary evolutionary theory. 
Uh, I think, I fear that one of the most misunderstood things today is how we scientists understand how evolutionary processes function. We have an amazing understanding, but most of the public discourse, and unfortunately most of the academic discourse, is reflecting an understanding of evolutionary biology that is 20 or 30 years out of date. So I'd like to just bring you up to date slightly there. Uh, and then finally, I want to use a, a couple examples from the fossil and archaeological record to uh, show you what a contemporary approach to human evolution looks like. I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of warfare, a very hot topic, and stone tools. Not so exciting, but hopefully by the end you'll agree that stone tools are fascinating and incredible. Um, and I want to end with a contemporary approach to human evolution, sort of where I want us all to sort of end up. And this is the notion that cooperation, creativity, and compassion, and conflict, are all central to the human experience. And trying to prioritize one over the others is problematic. All right, so to start with, and this is what I always do when I'm talking about human evolution, let me point out that this is the wrong image. I don't care if people think it's funny or whatever versions there are of this. Uh, it is not only wrong, it's deleterious. It is damaging. Okay? Because this is nothing, there's nothing about evolution that can be represented in this way. So, for example, if we want the right image um, to like, situate us in the large scale of evolutionary time, it actually looks like this. Um, so there, there's mammals just sticking off a, a little, you probably can't read this, but these are all sort of organisms that we know of, and this is a, a genetic, a phylogenetic relationship between organisms. We're stuck here in mammals. Okay. That's actually what it looks like. And this is an oversimplification. But we could say, well, what about just human? What about just us? What is our lineage? Well, our lineage in a taxonomic sense would look something like this. And you probably can't read this. But this is a, 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 a taxonomic cluster. We can thank Linnaeus for these uh, titles. Uh, he gave us these categories. Of the family hominidae, which is a family in the order of primates, right, uh, in the class mammalia. And in this family, um, taxonomic family of Hominidae, which we basically call the apes and humans. We have a, an African lineage, the Hominidae, and an Asian lineage, the Pongenae. The Pongenae are, are the orangutans. Um, and the uh, African lineage is divided up into three clusters, or tribes, which is the taxonomic unit between genus and subfamily. Unfortunately, tribe has the end I and I. So uh, chimpanzees are panini, which sounds like an Italian sandwich, and uh, <laughs> it's problematic. Anyways, it's, it's the chimpanzees, gorillas, and humans that are, share uh, a, a common deep ancestry back in the Miocene. And so this is a right image, right? But it, no, you don't see one following the other on this. Or if we want to get really specific and you want things to follow from one to the other, here's as good as you can get. All right, we have the Miocene hominoids. This is a group of, uh, of ancestral uh, primate things from which all of the apes and humans are derived. Let's imagine this is about 22 million years ago. Uh, we get a diversification into a ton of extinct lineages that were really cool, including Gigantopithecus, right? What everyone thinks is still Bigfoot, but they went extinct a couple hundred thousand years ago. That's a whole other talk. Um, but we have sort of three lineages, these extinct ones. Then we have the Hylobatidae, which are gibbons, beautiful apes, one of the most beautiful sounding organisms on the planet. If you ever have a chance to Google gibbon song, do so. It's beautiful. Um, that's one kind of apes. They're called the smaller apes. Uh, then we have the Hominidae, which again is the Asian and African apes and humans. Um, and this, this branch shows up probably 16 to 18 million years ago, which then gives rise to the African and the Asian group. Whoops. Did I just turn off the, uh, yes. Which gives rise to the Asian uh, and, and African group. And it's in the African group, uh, this diversification in the last 12, 10 million, 14 million years ago, that we have this sort of cluster of different things. And it's this cluster that we're interested in. This is as good as, this is as close as you can get to a linear representation. Okay? Why am I spending so much time on this? Because that sort of chimpanzee walking into an upright human with then all the funny things of it then sitting down at a computer or something like that. That's not only a bad way to talk about evolution, it absolutely robs the wonder. It takes away everything in this amazing panoply of diversity and biological evolution. So this is the right way to think about it. Um, so, and here is that here, I just pointed out these sort of lineage that's shown up in the last 10 million years or so. Here they are, right? Uh, you can't see it, don't worry. This is just published uh, um, last week. Uh, an overview of all of the different potential fossil species that could be in the cluster somewhat related to humans. 
right? We have a cluster of things that we're not sure what they are, but they look like they might be potentially ancestral to the cluster of things that we know are related to humans. Then we have a cluster of things that are in the basal sort of range. And then we have a whole bunch of different lineages, some of which are very close to us, and then we have us. We show up about 200,000 years ago. That is things that we know look just like you and I, um, emerging from some cluster in here. Okay, so that's what it looks like. It's much more interesting. Uh, it's too bad you can't see this better. Uh, it's much more interesting to see it this way. Here's uh, about six million years, a variety of different species and fossils. The point being here is that in the last million years or so, you can see that there are a number of species simultaneously, or whatever they are, maybe they're species, subspecies, or just clusters of things that are closely related, that are all sort of living around the same time. So between a million and about 50,000 years ago, there were many things that were not exactly the same, but that are in the human range. So for example, if we were to go to Java, oh, and you really can't see this. There's actually a skull here and two skulls here. If you were to go to Java 50,000 years ago, you could find Homo erectus, which is, we think is a, not a direct ancestor, but an off branch of uh, earlier ancestral form. Uh, Homo floresiensis, the diminutive peoples uh, of Southeast Asia that lived to about 12, 15,000 years ago. And Homo sapiens, you and I. Um, so you had Homo erectus, this sort of Homo floresiensis, the little people and humans all in the same place at the same time. Little did we know that J.R.R. Tolkien and Peter Jackson were right. We had orcs, <laughs> hobbits, and humans. See, everyone has already said what's really interesting already in the past. So, I, I, can't, I do that all the time. I just love the fact that these three things were coexistent in Java at the time. So Java's Middle Earth, which is something Tolkien didn't have right. So, all humor aside, one thing that we do know from this dense and rich fossil and archaeological record is that over the last two million years, members of our genus, the genus Homo, and we're not going to debate as to how many members there were. Some people say one, some people say 15. Let's just leave it at that. Human lineage underwent an incredible change in brains, bodies, and behavior, creating a new way of being in the world. We are distinctive creatures on this planet. And that pattern of distinction emerged specifically over the last two million years and precisely in ways that are, I think, relevant to the kinds of issues that many of you are interested in. So um, this change, uh, there's a number of things associated with it. I'm not going to go into the details here, but I just want to point out a few things. Something very interesting, if we look at climatological variability on the planet, during the Pleistocene, which is that period of, of most of human evolution, the Pleistocene uh, runs uh, from about 2.6 million years ago to about 10,000 years ago. Um, it's a geological uh, epoch. Um, what we notice is if we look at uh, um, uh, uh, fluctuating uh, uh, oxygen levels and a variety of other indicators, we see huge climate fluctuation over the last million years especially, um, but over the two million year time period of the genus Homo um, at, with the last 500,000 years or so being the most explosive climatologically variable time period uh, in the last 10 or 15 million years. Now, that, why is that interesting? It's very interesting because certain types of organisms do extremely well in this hyper-fluctuating climates. Certain generalized, malleable, flexible organisms. Humans are one of those. And the argument is that we've had a kind of ecological context that is particular in this time period that has facilitated some of the things that we're going to talk about. Um, you can see uh, just a variety of different things have happened over the last two million years. Um, morphologically, um, all things in the genus Homo, the bodies got taller, but more gracile. That is taller and sort of thinner bones, smaller teeth. And our brains began to grow substantially. Between about 1. Point, let's say 6 and 1.6 million and 500,000 years ago, our brains more than doubled in size and, and since then have radically increased in complexity, but not size. Our brains are actually smaller now than they were 100,000 or 200,000 years ago. Um, so that's very interesting. There's some interesting things going on there. Uh, and then uh, there's a whole archaeological change from about 2 million years ago through today, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about. So there, there's absolute abundant evidence that the last two million years have been extremely complex and extremely interesting in our own evolution. Um, uh, it's also the time that uh, all humans, all the entire human lineage, as I pointed out, originated in Africa. But starting about two million years ago, human-like things moved out and around 
uh, Eurasia and, and into Southeast Asia. Um, so from about 2 million years ago, maybe 1.7 million years ago, small groups of our potential ancestors, or things very closely related to our ancestors, were actually moving much more broadly than any other, almost any other group of organisms. So that, that in itself is a very interesting thing. And encountering new and complex environments. Um, and again, this you can't see very well, but it's a bunch of uh, uh, skulls representing these different things. What's really amazing in this two million year story is that by about, even though we have so many different types of things over this time period, by about one million years ago, everything not in our genus, genus Homo, in our lineage, is extinct. And then by about 20 to 50,000 years ago, everything in our genus that's not us goes extinct. And we are all that's left. So it's very interesting to so have this huge diversity, radiation of forms that has been winnowed over time fairly radically with only one representative left. That's an atypical pattern for mammals. And that one who got left is now one of the largest, not only biomass components of mammalian biology on the planet, but has single-handedly, well, not single-handedly, because we use other things a lot, but has been responsible for moving us into an entire new epoch, the Anthropocene. We now shape the ecology of the entire planet. So there is something interesting going on here. There is something about this species. You know, I have a lot of colleagues who always say, I make too much of humans. Well, they say that while standing in a building or having just flown 10,000 miles at 35,000 feet. It's like, so yes, blue whales and gorillas are amazing. But let's take a step back. Why did this one lineage make it? How do we think about this? It's a great responsibility. And, and we need to take this much more seriously than many people do. All right, so most people explain it this way. Uh, it is a very common thing here. Since uh, you can only see part of this is uh, Goya's uh, uh, Fourth of May painting. Um, this is uh, after the rebellion in Madrid against Napoleon's troops. Uh, Napoleon took out most of the Spaniards who rebelled against them and shot them. Um, and people hold up this kind of argument that, that really, why is this species, why, why are humans so successful? It's because we sort of wipe everything out that we're aggressors, that it's conflict and competition that has allowed us to dominate the planet. I'd like to suggest that that is not only wrong, but it's hypersimplistic and misses actually the kind of complexities that make humans really interesting. Not that we don't do this, but that this is not actually either the baseline or the explanation for why humans do as well as they do. So this, this narrative often argues that aggression, violence, and conflict are really the sort of central parts of being human in an evolutionary sense, right? If you look over the evolutionary time, why are we the last ones standing? Even saying that we're the last ones standing seems to imply that it's our fault that the rest aren't standing anymore. Well, I'd like to suggest that I'm not sure that this truly reflects what we might call a human nature. So the traditional approach basically argues, and this is the evolutionary approach. I know there are many, many other approaches, and there's the theological approaches are, are quite different than this. But the evolutionary approach, the one that's usually promulgated, not only in academia, but especially in the public, is this concept of, of well, uh, and here's Goya again. Here's uh, Jupiter eating his uh, uh, offspring. <laughs> that competition is central to the human experience. That humanity is inherently violent, at least males. Uh, and the competition between males for females is one of the reasons for violence. And again, you can't see it very well. There's a picture from Fight Club. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this movie. But everyone loves this because guys love to fight, right? Like rams, you know, if you watch adult, you know, uh, mountain sheep that you can find out around here sometimes. I mean, these males, when they're rutting, they'll just smack their heads against each other until one passes out. <laughs> and we're like, well, that's guys, right? That's, that's sort of human nature. That's how things happen. Let me point out that, first of all, this, this thing about rams, I'm not going to explain it, but it's really much more complicated than that. And the rams that smack each other in the head and pass out, well, they're just doing that to get near the females. It doesn't mean the females are going to pick them. <laughs> that's, that's part of the story they frequently leave out. Anyway, this is the sort of common assumptions. Um, and it's... You know, there's evidence for this. Now, these people were not killed by pencils being thrown at them. There's, <laughs> there's, the pencils are pointing towards uh, blades that are embedded, uh, stone blades that are embedded in the skeletons. This is a, uh, a site, Jebel Sabaha, in, in, uh, in the uh, northern Sudan. It's about uh, 10, 12,000 years old. We have evidence of horrible cruelty 
of murder and even of warfare in parts of our past. I'm not saying that's not the case. What I am saying is that the vast majority of the evidence is more like this. This is from the site of Gobero um, in Niger. Um, and this is a, an adult woman buried with two children, buried with their hands intertwined, looking at one another. I would like to lay out the argument that this notion of a primacy of competition, of warfare, of aggression and violence is a misrepresentation of the actual data that we have and it under, in, underplays the kind of cooperative complexity that we see in the human past as part of the explanation for why we're here today. So the alternative view I would like to argue for, and we'll spend the next 25 minutes or so doing, uh, is that competition and cooperation are both central to the human spirit, and they're not separate things. They're not even two ends of the same continuum. Um, that we are wired to be social. And that has a, a very, very deep implications. That cooperation is more common than conflict. And that violence, while inherent in human societies, okay, oh, sorry, common violence, while potential in human societies, is not inherent. That is, there are many, many, many options available to humanity. Violence is not the go-to for most of our history and for most of today, despite of what you see if you watch CNN or read the New York Times. All right. So uh, humans are distinct, again, I apologize for the size of these words, because we have shared intentionality. That is, we're able to cognitively coincide in a group on a single goal. We are pervasively hyper-cooperative. We are niche constructors, or master niche constructors, which I'll explain what that means momentarily. But, but importantly, throughout this two million year history, we see increasingly complex material and landscape manipulation, systematic compassion, which I will come back to, uh, and a ubiquitous use of symbol and imagination. These are distinctive patterns and processes of being human that are reflected in the fossil record and that are undervalued and under-theorized, probably because they're messier and more complicated than just saying we sort of killed all the competitors. All right, so uh, my colleague John Marks, and I'll read this so that you can hear it, uh, recently said, the most significant paradox in the study of human evolution is that human evolution over the last few million years has been biocultural evolution. And thus, it is perversely unscientific to try and imagine it, to try and imagine human evolution, as simply a succession of biological processes and effects. Without confronting the cultural aspects of human evolution, one cannot approximate the reality of our origins or of human nature. So the bones and stones are important, but they are only part of the story. The real challenge in trying to understand the last two million years is to develop a coherent, complex, and scientifically accurate description of how we go from two million years ago being a group of organisms that can make these stone tools. Now, I know you're not impressed with these stone tools, but you should be. Uh, I'll try to show you why. These are old Awan stone tools. These, are about, these ones here are about 1.86 million years old. Nothing else on the history of this planet has ever taken stone and modify it for a secondary use. Nothing ever. Be impressed. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you how it's even more impressive than there's that in a little bit. But, but the bottom line here is we need to develop a high set of hypotheses that get us from organisms that can make these stone tools at two million years ago to organisms that can do this kind of unbelievably imaginative and beautiful art at 40,000 years ago to organisms that can build New York City and global transportation networks today. That's the challenge of human evolution. And we're not going to get there by modeling changes in the cranium, while the changes in the cranium are important. All right, so again, this is the story of hominid evolution. Everything goes extinct except us. That's the challenge. And us is a very, very distinctive presence on this planet. So here's one explanation. I'm glad the words are very small. There won't be a test. <laughs> um, uh, our colleagues uh, Fiona Coward and uh, Matt Grove just took an overview in 2011 of all of the available physiological, fossil, archaeological data sets and looked at what they highlighted that might be relevant to understanding this process. OK, human evolution is unbelievably complicated. It involves physiology, neurobiology, archaeology, paleontology, geology, chemistry, a wide variety of ologies. 
just to get an idea of these processes. So the complexity is enormous. We're not going to focus too much on this really intensive complexity, but I just want to point out that this is what honest work in human evolution looks like. So when you see the lineage of the, like the chimpanzee walking you know, slowly up to the human, remember, this is what we're talking about, not that. All right. Um, but there are ways to deal with complexity. And one of the best ways to deal with complexity is to accept it and to engage with it in all of its complexity. And that's where we stand today with evolutionary biology. Most people have a very archaic and outdated notion of evolutionary theory. So I'm going to update you briefly on where we are today in evolutionary theory. And I think it's really important because people always talk about Darwinian evolution. And today we call this sort of uh, the up until recently the standard overview of evolutionary theory, neo-Darwinian evolution. Well, let me point out, if Darwin were around today, Darwin would not be a Darwinian. He would not because it's overly simplistic, it's reductionistic, and it doesn't reflect the state of the art of the data from evolutionary biology. So let me point out where we are today. Uh, and to do so, let me use my favorite philosopher of science, Gary Larson. Um, <laughs> I know you missed the Wainwrights, Bobby, but they were weak and stupid people. That's why we have wolves and other large predators. <laughs> This is how we usually think about, and be honest, this is how people think about natural selection, right? Natural selection is out there sort of weeding out the sort of unfit, right? But no, that's not how it works. Not at all. There are two other major problems with evolutionary investigation, and let me stick with Gary Larson to demonstrate them. The first one, it says great moments in evolution. I don't know if you can see, there's a bunch of fish with a baseball bat and their ball ends up on the ground. <laughs> this focus on single events like when we stood up, or when we made tools, or when our brains got big, have failed miserably. Single event catalysts are almost non-existent as explanatory possibilities in evolutionary biology. The, things, the systems are just too complex. Uh, and the second problem, and this is a problem where I think a lot of scientists need to slow down sometimes, and as we were talking this morning, uh, think a little about the history and philosophy of science. How we ask questions and what we do with those questions matters a lot. So for example, here's a bunch of uh, scientists looking at dolphin language, and one says to the other, Matthews, we're getting another one of those strange habla espanol sounds. <laughs> <laughs> and I love this. Here it says, que pasa, you know, habla espanol. Here's my favorite, buen feo. Which you're, you're really ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Buenos dias. The point is, is, you know, the joke here is that these scientists know what they're going to find. Of course dolphins would speak English. Have you noticed that all foreign, all aliens, whenever they come, to, they always speak English, right? I mean, and if you think about it, if the aliens did their work, they'd say, well, English is this broad economic and powerful language, but if we really want to hook into sort of the most populous, you know, they would be speaking Mandarin or Hindi. And if they're speaking Hindi and it was a Bollywood movie, they'd do some great dancing. <laughs> The bottom line here is that we, evolutionary biology has really moved away from these sort of single trait uh, or single loci arguments really towards a complex systems approach. Now, that's much harder to, to sort of relate to the public and, and really much harder to relate to other academic disciplines because it involves a real investment in the state-of-the-art knowledge in evolutionary biology, but it is more accurate. And I hope that by, you know, in another half hour, you will agree it's much more interesting. Okay, um, so the extended evolutionary synthesis, I'm not going to explain this all, I'm just going to run through it very quickly. So if you have no familiarity with evolutionary biology, it's going to sound like gobbledygook, but I'll make it make sense by the end. Um, mutation, this is where we are today uh, in contemporary evolutionary theory 2016. Mutation, genetic, epigenetic, and developmental processes produce variation. The big difference from old notions, people used to focus only on genetic mutation. We now know that epigenetic processes, processes not of the DNA, but influencing the way the DNA works, are as important, if not more important, in a lot of especially complex organisms like humans. We also know that developmental processes are core in producing variation, not just canalizing variation. Um, we know that natural selection shapes that variation, right? We also know that gene flow and genetic drift, uh, gene flow is the movement uh, of, of genes through, you know, sort of DNA material across and through populations. And genetic drift are random events uh, that happen. Um, so we know gene flow and genetic drift structure the distribution of patterns of variation. We know that organism-environment interaction can result in niche construction, which again, that term is up here and I'll explain it shortly, uh, which creates ecological inheritance. 
that phenotypic and developmental plasticity affect the patterns in production variation. Um, we heard phenotype yesterday in, in Nancy's talk. The sort of, there, there's a lot of variation. The connection between genes and this not only is not always clear, it's definitely not linear, and it's never one to one. And uh, multiple pathways of inheritance affect evolutionary processes. Let me spend two seconds on this. We always used to focus on only genetic inheritance as core to understanding evolution. We now know that epigenetic inheritance is absolutely critical, right? Epigenetic inheritance. So, for example, fetal stress, right, on mammals during pregnancy, so maternal stress on the mother leads to fetal stress, which activates particular patterns of methylation. We were talking about the brain yesterday. Particular patterns of those coatings on the brain. We talked, she talked about, Nancy talked about the myelin coatings on the brain. So those myelin coatings are associated with something called methylation, which is a particular chemical process on the neurons. Maternal stress impacts fetal development, which causes shifts not in the DNA, but into those processes of supporting those neurons, which can cause downstream effects in those children and those children's children without any change to the genetics. That's really important. And we think this is one way in which major evolutionary shifts actually happen. Uh, we also know that uh, behavioral evolution, behavioral inheritance is very important. And for humans, there's a plethora of recent work, uh, uh, particularly nodding to here, Eva Jablonka and Marion Lamb, of a wonderful book, uh, Evolution in Four Dimensions. There's recent work showing that symbolic, that is the perceptual impression that we have of the world, actually has downstream biological effects. All right, so that's where we are in contemporary evolutionary theory. It is best summarized by Kevin Leyland of uh, St. Andrews University in Scotland, who's a pioneer in niche construction and uh, uh, extended evolutionary synthesis, when he says, organisms are constructed in development, not simply programmed to develop by genes. Living things do not evolve to fit into pre-existing environments, but they co-construct and co-evolve with their environments and in the process change the structure of ecosystems. This is how evolution works. Not that other stuff of the you know, natural selection weeding out the weak. Yes, do you have a question? Yeah, can I ask it? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, is that statement true not only of humans but of other yeah, organisms? Yeah, oh, no, no, this is not about, this is about evolutionary processes. Everything I just pointed out, this is the way, I mean, and I'll show you two examples in a moment. Okay, um, this has to do with niche construction, uh, which is one of the things I mentioned. Now, you can't see this, but let me just point out really quickly. No, sorry, I keep saying that you can't see this. This is going to sound funny on the tape, because um, you will be able to see it on the tape. Um, the traditional, here's the environment, here's gene pools, here's traditional Darwinian evolution, neo-Darwinian evolution, that the environment puts pressure called natural selection on gene pools, which shapes those gene pools into the next generation, where the environment then puts more pressure on it. Right? That's the traditional way. So the external environment shapes gene pools. In niche construction, the external environment puts pressures on the gene pool, but the organisms respond to that pressure as it's happening, potentially shaping the very pressures that they're responding to. And then over time, that's not only the gene pools that shift, but in fact, the environments also shift because of the interaction with organisms. And if you think about humans, are responsive to the world's pressures are not just genetic processes, they're also learning processes, they're cooperative group processes, they're cultural processes, there are a number of different kinds of processes. So everything humans do is evolutionarily relevant. All right, um, there are two other groups, I um, can't see it, here's a Castor canadiensis, the uh, beaver. Um, and here's earthworms. So beavers are great examples of niche construction. So when beavers show up in an area, uh, they build a dam. That dam changes the landscape. It changes the chemical composition of the soil. It changes the uh, ecology of the water. It changes the species uh, that are living in that area, all of which creating an ecology that is much improved for the offspring of the beaver. So they're changing the way in which the ecology works. Um, earthworms are actually another good example. And actually, Darwin used this example, not realizing that it was in niche construction. Darwin talked about how when you put worms into a virgin soil, into soil with no earthworms, they do what earthworms do, which is ingest soil, right? Extract nutrients and, and exude that soil. In doing so, they change the physical structure of the landscape, aerating the soil. They also change the chemical structures of the soil, creating an environment that is much more beneficial to subsequent earthworms and, and to plants and a variety of other things. This is what niche construction is. However, humans take that to the next level. <laughs> Humans are master niche constructors. We alter the world's ecologies, climates, and organisms in ways that nothing else does. And massive manipulation along this pattern is rooted in a deep history 
of Nietzsche construction. So human evolution is not about the environment impacting individuals. It's not about sort of co cooperation or competition just between two individuals. Really, to get where we are today, we need to ask questions about the relationships between individuals and communities. The only way that we can model effectively the kinds of processes that we see in the human evolutionary past is by thinking about communities. So it's not so much about sex and competition. It's really about getting stuff done together. If we look, and I'm going to show you a couple examples, at the human past, the last two million years when all these changes happened, it was not individuals running around with a stick hitting things, although they did that. But they never did it alone, which is extremely important. All right, so three examples, fire, predators, and uh, stone tools, right? Very, very quickly. First of all, this is something we don't usually talk about. We love the theme man the hunter, right? That's a very common theme. Well, for the vast majority of our history, we're actually humans the hunted. <laughs> um, and it's terrifying how many fossils you find with like giant uh, lion teeth. This is actually a real fossil. Um, there's the, it's, it's this. Uh, there's actually the embeddedness of uh, lion's uh, lower canines into the cranium of one of our ancestors. Um, and we find lots of these. How do we know? Well, m all, most of the fossils we find before, about 1.5 million years ago, have been chewed up. Uh, by large things. And there were lots of large things, okay? There were 14 types of uh, large hyenas and saber-toothed cats coexisting with our ancestors. The smallest ones were this big. Okay, the uh, cro Paki crocuda stood this tall. You imagine a group of 27 hyenas of this size. Um, so predation, we know from the fossil evidence and the sort of carnivore ecology was a major thing. So how did our ancestors deal with this. Now, we've got to think about this. Two million years ago, this sort of transition, the beginning of our story, is a time of incredible predation for all of the primates, particularly the primates running around on the ground who were this tall, who were naked, who had no horns, no fangs, no claws. They had like a couple rocks and some sticks. How did they make it? What did they have? They had each other. They began to cooperate. They began to coordinate. They began to use a kind of community interaction of cooperation and collaboration that had not been seen before. And this enabled them to begin to understand predators, to understand how to avoid them, and slowly but surely to understand how to follow predators, to take advantage of their kills, and eventually to flip that around and to start to take the kills from other predators. It turns out something called power scavenging is incredibly important in changing the nutritional landscape of our ancestors. To grow a big brain, you need a lot of nutrition, and you're not getting that by sort of foraging for grubs and things like that. You need a lot of meat and some underground storage organs, roots and tubers. How do we know this? We find a transition from about, one point, about 2 million years ago to about 1.4 million years ago where we find stone tools and large uh, carnivore kills. Initially, all the stone tool marks are on top of the tooth marks that the carnivores make. So the carnivores killed, ate some stuff, then somehow or another, our ancestors got in there and started taking a little bit of what was left. Slowly but surely, we see a transition where, over time, the stone tool marks are underneath the carnivore knob, showing us that our ancestors were getting access to the meat before the carnivores had spent a lot of time with it. That transition is a long story. I won't talk about it here. But that has to do with a new type of communication and cooperation. Um, stone tools. Uh, you can't say this too bad. This is a beautiful uh, artist rendering of, of uh, a site in Orligosai in uh, East Africa um, at about 1.8 million years ago, where we know a group of at least seven individuals uh, defleshed uh, a large elephant. Um, and it's an absolutely beautiful site to show the kind of cooperation and coordination that would have been necessary to engage in this kind of activity. We also know that the uh, use of fire, the development of digging uh, for very, very rich tubers and roots, and the creation of stone tools all involved a kind of cooperation and collaboration that was not present previously. So what is so uh, unique about human cooperation? Um, uh, today, we have all of these things, um, and they arose sometime in the last two million years. They include cooperative child rearing, male care, Male care is actually quite rare for most mammals. It is, an, it, it is a core part of human uh, parenting. Uh, we have very complex parenting with extreme alloparenting. Um, the, the, the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, is actually not scientifically erroneous. It's accurate. Um, there is no evidence up until very, very recently that humans tried to raise children by just one or two, with just one or two adults. 
Um, usually it was uh, cooperative child rearing in many cases. And we have the physiology, if we want to talk about it later, and demonstrate we actually have very good evidence of human physiology in males and females that's highly responsive to infants, highly responsive. Um, we have a, a kind of caring and compassion for others that is not found in other organisms. And this compassion is quite deep in the evolutionary record, and we have evidence of it. Um, we have evidence of individuals as much as 1.8 million years ago at a site in what is today Georgia uh, in, in Europe. 1.8 million years ago of an aged individual who had lost all of his teeth. At this point, he was probably in his 50s, which was very aged at that point. Um, lost all of his teeth and lived for at least another seven years. That is, the, the, all, every, the gums had receded into the bone, which takes a long time to do. So he had lived without dentition for quite some time. When they were eating, remember this is before fire. So he had to have other individuals process, helping process, even chew the food for him. Uh, and there are a number, a number of uh, instances of that deep in our evolutionary history. We also have uh, uh, kinship beyond biology, and, and really this pattern of facing environmental challenges as a community, not as individuals. So bottom line, creativity and cooperation are not the opposites of conflict and competition. They're complementary. They're part of the same thing. Just very, very briefly, let me talk to you a little bit about stone tools and about aggression in the human past. Um, Again, you're probably not too impressed with stone tools like this, but as uh, uh, Kim Sterelny and Peter Hiscock remind us, uh, stone tools were the material symbols long before ochre and jewelry of behavioral modernity. Stone tools are incredibly hard to make. I dare you to go out there, grab a stone, and make a stone tool. I, you will get the wrong stone. You will cut your hand and bleed, uh, and it will be a lousy job. It takes a long time, and it's very difficult. It takes us, in modern technology, a few weeks to teach very, very intelligent uh, um, university students how to make the most simple stone tools effectively. Um, we know that to make a stone tool, this is an old one stone tool. Again, like I said, this is just under two million years old. You need to uh, acquire and transport the materials. Even 1.8 million years ago, we find that our ancestors were transporting stone tools as much as 12 to 14 kilometers. They were walking amidst all of those giant predators getting certain stones and bringing them across very large distances to use and to work. That's actually very interesting and requires a kind of coordination and cooperation. We also know that you have to develop and, and learn these methods. These methods have to be taught or at least facilitated. So we think of more of an apprentice style uh, sort of model. Um, and that we know that there's innovation. Over time, the tools get better and better. How do we know this? My colleague Dietrich Stout at Emory and uh, uh, John Dagan is in Roche in, in, in France. Uh, we go to these sites, and not we, I say we, not me, they, uh, and a lot of students, and grad students and postdocs, um, put back together from these flint napping sites, all the debitage, so we can put that back together, all the pieces from that original cobble that they created the stone tool out of. So we can see how they hit it, where they hit it, where it was broken, where they shifted their grips and looked at it, and then we can model all of this. Now, we couldn't do this before, but now we can. You can model it, and you can show the kind of intense complex processes that making stone tools, even the oldest stone tools is. And don't order yet, but if we go a little bit further, we can see how they were used, and we can recognize that these things were not made by individuals for use by individuals. Rather, they're tool kits used in groups, and there's evidence in the processing sites, the butchering sites that we see, that we're almost always seeing collections of individuals doing these things. And more interestingly, recently, a lot of experimental studies have demonstrated that making tools, especially as we get into slightly more complex stone tools, tends to fire certain areas of the brain. Which of those areas? They're areas we heard about yesterday. Broca's and Wernicke's areas, plus some other connection areas. The language centers of the brain are actually co-opted in the process of tool making. Well, we don't know exactly why that is, but it is very interesting that early on, as our brains were growing and becoming more complex, we're deploying and utilizing particular areas of the brain uh, that later become extremely important in a very distinctive human process language. All right, um, so humans actually have a very, very complex neurobiology. We talked about that yesterday. We can skip over it today. Um, and I'm going to, well, I'm not going to skip over this. Um, this is in uh, Libya. This is uh, Sahel Masaket. It's a, uh, a site that spans about six kilometers. It doesn't look very interesting right now, and you probably can't see very well, but this is a site that for the last 200,000 years has been used by humans to make stone tools uh, because it's a very rich outcrop. And it used to be actually sort of a, it had palm trees and, and water. Now it's sort of deadly. Uh, but if you go out there, 
in some areas over a two kilometer landscape of this larger six kilometer square area, over this two kilometer area, if you go out and take one meter squares, you find a density as much as 60 lithics, 60 stone tool or tool fragments per square meter in this area. This was a gigantic assembly line of stone tools for hundreds of thousands of years. And I also nod to the niche construction, this whole idea that humans are really radically changing the planet. Well, 100,000 years ago, we were already radically changing the planet in smaller but significant ways. Um, and then really, really quickly, I'm going to end up uh, on this, uh, the archaeology of violence. Everyone talks about violence. Um, here's a nice, uh, this is a, uh, what been argued to be the first example of warfare or violence at 800,000 years ago. Here's a 400,000-year-old individual that got smacked in the head and died. Um, here are the two earliest examples of anything we could call warfare. That is, groups coordinating to attack other groups. Uh, one just came out in Nature. It was just published last week. Very famous. Everyone's very excited about it. It's uh, 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 Nataruk in uh, uh, Lake Turkana in Kenya. It's about 9,200 years old. 27 individuals, at least 10, uh, died from violent trauma. It's very, very clear. They were attacked and brutally murdered. Uh, at Jebel Sabah, which I showed you the pencil deaths earlier, um, Jebel Sabah is about 10, maybe 12,000 years old. Um, and about 24 or 59 skeletons in a graveyard show evidence of, of uh, atrocity, that is, death via trauma. Now, I want you to keep in mind these dates. Because when we go, and, and, and there's good, these are very, very good, robust data. When we go and look across the last 10,000 years ago, and I'm just listing, I'm not going to read these through, we have a number of sites, 30, or, oh, sorry, 30 or 40 sites where we see evidence of intergroup organized conflict, the closest thing that we could call warfare. But all of these dates, 5,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, uh, 4,000 years ago, 4 or 5,000 years ago, 4 to 2,000 years ago, should tell you something. I was just talking about a 2 million year history. So it turns out we don't see any evidence of coordinated intergroup violence. Not that it didn't exist, but we don't see any evidence of it in the fossil and archaeological record until about 10 to 12,000 years ago right at the time where some significant transitions are happening. Sedentism, storage, social inequality. If we look, and uh, two of my colleagues have done this and are about to publish it, at all of the data before um, uh, 12,000 years ago, all of the fossils that we have, and it's over 2,700 individuals plus a ton of thousands and thousands of fragments, you find that less than 2% of every bit of data, every point of data we have, every individual, less than 2% show any evidence of trauma, physical trauma, leading to death. It doesn't mean people didn't run around hitting each other. But the kind of coordinated intergroup aggression doesn't appear, at least to date, prior to this time period. And then it ratchets up with the time period uh, about 5,000 to about 2,000 uh, years ago being one of the highest. Today, it's very hard to calculate because there's so many people. It depends on how you calculate it. Just calculating death doesn't get you the same kind of numbers. We can talk about that later. Bottom line is that there's been some interesting patterns in the last 10,000 years that were not common prior to that. Um, and in fact, as I pointed out before, the vast majority of our archaeological evidence looks like this. No evidence of conflict. This is from Gobero. It's a, a 7,000 year old cemetery. We have over 200 individuals. Not a single one had violent trauma anywhere recorded in their bones. Doesn't mean they didn't have hard lives. Didn't mean they didn't have conflicts. Didn't mean they didn't compete with others. It just means that this is actually typical. But you never read about this. We never read about this. For every one of those sites, like Nataruk, that was just published, for every one of those sites, there are 20 or more other sites from the same time period that don't show evidence of incredible violence. So warfare is present, and it's associated, or intergroup violence is associated with the transitions from foraging to more sedentary and urban lifestyle. There's a whole bunch of reasons why that might be, and we can talk about that. But it's extremely important when we think about this long durée of human evolution and the processes under which we have changed, evolved, and come to be ourselves. So warfare is a creative and collaborative act just like um, peace. And I'm not going to provide the data here, but there's some really interesting data that show that to do warfare, to do intergroup violence, which we think of as this cruel example, you have to be a better cooperator than the other group. So actually cooperation under, and compassion for one another and for your fellows actually drives success at warfare. So the human capacity for, for compassion and, and cooperation is a, is a double-edged sword. Um, and I, 
just want to point out that we have, and I'm not, since the time is short, we have an enormous amount of data for compassionate caring for others, bonding, caring beyond biological kin, and even beyond our species throughout human evolution. We have cooperative parenting alongside shared intentionality, strong physical and emotional bonding. We have sh food sharing across every human society. Food sharing is actually rare in the animal world. Um, and we have incredibly complex communication. Um, compassion in human evolution shows up. Uh, a woman named Penny Spickens, and I know you can't read this, but she has a uh, series of publications in a recent book out on compassion and human evolution, just looking at all the fossil evidence for compassion and human evolution. Something that is always never talked about at my professional conferences, um, but there is more evidence for acts of compassion than there is for acts of aggression. The human community niche, the, the way of being in the world, is a central part in understanding human evolution. How we came together, here's an example of the 28 Reconstruction of the 28 bodies from a site 400,000 years ago at Atapuerca that I'm going to say something very interesting about uh, in the next section. Um, the, the human community niche, working together, collaborating, cooperating, and competing, is the central locale which we have to engage with to understand human evolution. Human nature is about cooperation and creativity and all of the cascade effects that come from that, including conflict as well as peace. Cooperation and niche construction is incredible. The way in which we've ma manipulated and worked the world around us is substantial and complex. So when we think of the last two million years where we know humans have changed quite a bit, we can think about the genetic and neurobiological and physiological components, but we also think about the myriad of ways in which humans have spread around the world, have worked together to shape ecologies, to change the world, and very, very importantly, the way in which we perceive and imagine the world to be and how the world can be are central components in the human evolutionary story. I would just like to say that, and it's, this is a very impressive picture that you can't see very well, I would like to say that moving forward, we know the last two million years have been incredibly complex that are rooted in this kind of creative and cooperative processes in human evolution. But looking forward into the 21st century, how we tap that, how we think about that, is incredibly tied to how we represent the past. And misrepresentation of the past through evolutionary biology, <coughs> through ignoring of the entire fossil data set as opposed to the selective selection of particular fossil and particular ways of talking about the fossil record are damaging. Um, and that's all I have for part one. I will try my best to uh, be very brief on this, just to throw out this information, because I think it's very interesting, but I, I really want to have more time to chat. Um, so having set up a, a, just a very general overview of human evolution, and again, uh, I'd be glad to share articles and, and, and uh, um, references uh, with folks so they can sort of delve more deeply into this. I'd like to take two areas of, of uh, recent interest that, uh, work that I've been doing uh, over the past decade or so. Uh, that I think are particularly relevant, or I hope, well, I think they're relevant, you may or may not. Uh, one is sort of our current understanding of, of the biology of human variation and what it says about race and racism. Uh, I think racism is one of the major problems uh, facing the United States today and actually facing the globe. And I think uh, uh, it is my very heartfelt opinion that um, uh, the church is, is an important contributor into ameliorating this really damaging and very detrimental uh, part of our society. Um, and so uh, I think I want to talk a little bit about that coming from the sort of work in human biology. And then I want to talk about this project uh, that I'm uh, doing right now uh, uh, along with uh, uh, a number of postdocs, some graduate students, and the theologian Celia Dean Drummond. She and I uh, share a large Templeton grant uh, the Evolution of Wisdom, uh, looking at a variety of theological and anthropological topics. Uh, my end is looking at the appearance of symbolic material in the human record. Uh, and I think that's actually an interesting thing because I also think it has something to do with our understanding of the human, amazing human capacity for faith and hope. So um, I, I don't really have to say much more than this. Uh, I think this, this image reminds you of a lot, even though this image is from 50 years ago, it is as true today as it was then, if not worse. Um, uh, race and racism is a, a very problematic issue in the United States and globally. 
What I'd like to do then is to uh, <clears throat> point out very clearly that we know, uh, anthropologically speaking and biologically speaking, that the way we use race in, in most societies, let's just focus on the United States, the way we use race does not equal biology. Okay, it does not. Um, uh, but, but race really, really, really matters. So you frequently hear people say, well, race is a social construct. Yeah, that's fine, but race is real, and it has real physiological, biological, social, political, economic repercussions. So to say race is not biology doesn't mean it's not real, and I'd like to clarify exactly how that works. And I, 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 this might be a little bit uh, far afield for, for, for some of, of you in seminaries, but. But let, just stick with me. I think it might make sense. All right, so now most of us know this. I mean, this is sort of how um, people think of race, right? There's sort of this African cluster, there's sort of this European cluster, and then there's everything else is Asian, more or less. Ignore Australia, that just messes with stuff. We, we tend to think this in our, in our society. Sometimes there's five, sometimes there's three. This is a categorization. It's a, a sort of a pop notion of race. It's very powerful. Um, when I give this public lecture and, and show this image, people say, oh, well, I'm like, well, don't say you don't recognize this because you're lying. This is our cultural norm. This is the way we see the world. Now, this uh, seeing of the world has to do with skin color in many ways and a variety of other things. Let me just point out about skin color because uh, skin color is constantly misrepresented. So skin color is actually skin reflectance, right? It's for people who don't get physics, should, uh, and get some physics education. So skin color comes from the amount of white light that bounces off of skin. The amount of white light that bounces off skin has to do with the distribution and density of something called melanin, which is the pigment uh, that humans have. Melanin comes in two colors. What are the two colors? Anyone know? Black and brown. Those are the only two versions of melanin. Right? So melanin is produced by melanocytes uh, in the uh, layer between the dermis and the epidermis here. Uh, melanocytes are uh, 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 organelles that, 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 that produce melanin in a variety of different contexts. Now, if you have even, now all humans have about the same number of melanocytes. Okay? There's not a much variation in the number of melanocytes. Humans vary dramatically in the distribution of melanocytes. That's how those melanocytes are distributed, either evenly spread or clumped, and in the density or rate of production of melanin, whether you produce a lot of melanin constantly or a little melanin in spurts or very little melanin at all. That's, that's sort of the difference. If you have evenly distributed melanocytes and you produce a lot of melanin, you get a lot of white light absorption and your skin looks Darker, exactly, thank you. Darker. And if you have clustered melanocytes and lower melanin production, you reflect a lot of white light and your skin looks lighter. When you actually measure skin, we have a 36 grade reflectance chart. Um, so there's sort of 36 levels of reflectance that we use. So that's, that's sort of how uh, uh, the system works. Um, and if you look at the global distribution of indigenous populations, that is people who've been in the same place for a couple thousand years or longer, you find that there is a strong, a very statistically significant uh, correlation between evenly distributed, high produce, evenly distributed melanocytes that produce a lot of melanin, that is dark skin, uh, in the circumequatorial regions. As you move further north, you get clustered melanocytes and reduced melanin production. Right? Uh, and as you move south, well, you have water, so you don't have much variation there. Um, but that's, I think, an important point. If you compare that to the incidence of UV radiation, you know, because of the shape of the Earth and its relationship to the sun, um, uh, radiation incident, the intensity of UV light is much higher around the equator uh, and drops off as you move towards the poles, unless you have a giant hole in the ozone layer and there's something else going on. Um, so what's very interesting is that there is an enormous amount of work, and I suggest you read Nina Jablonski's Skin and Natural History. She's a biological anthropologist, wrote the best book on skin and the biology of skin. There's a strong correlation between in time or ancestry relative to the equator and darkness of skin, right? Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. UV light is carcinogenic. UV light, if UV light gets through uh, the epidermis into the dermis, it can cause all sorts of problems. So uh, humans have, and many organisms, have evolved uh, coloring as a protection uh, against that. As you move north, if you are dark colored, you actually have uh, too little UV light. UV light is actually used in the synthesis of vitamin D and a few other uh, components in the body. So you actually get natural selection for clustering of melanocytes. So most people in this room have highly clustered melanocytes with low melanin production. But if you go and stand out in the sun for a while, you get to see what happens when your uh, UV light kicks on the, the immediate response. What's that response called? Tanning. Tanning, but 
even more quickly, what do you, many of you get? Sunburn. Well, sunburn if it, because it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> freckles. So freckles are your clusters of melanocytes going to town when they're stimulated by the UV light. So the, we, we know a lot about skin color. But if you look here, nothing about skin color gives us those races, right? So there isn't an, a sort of an African cluster, a uh, European cluster, and an uh, Asian cluster. So skin color is actually distributed relative to ancestry, relative to the equator. Um, so skin color actually doesn't give us races. It doesn't even fit that category that we use it to fit. Um, now what about genetic ancestry? Everyone can spit in a cup and send it off to 23andMe or whoever else. You guys have all heard about these. So, and they will tell you who you are. Or they'll give you a little pie chart that tells you what percentage of uh, different samples you are. And, and it is absolutely true. Oh, let me point out something. Does anyone see anything weird about this map? This is, is something that I try to encourage people to do. Uh, this is not the Mercator projection. This is an accurate projection or a more accurate projection. So in this case, um, Alaska is not the size of China. Um, and there's something very interesting. The Mercator projection robs right, the central and southern latitudes of their size. This is actually what, so Africa's really, really, really big, um, which I, one could argue is a political act of map makers to reduce that size. Anyways, I just want to point that out, because I, I think it's really important to think about what the world looks like, and we are not the biggest thing. All right, neither is Alaska. Alaska's small. And this is actually even an oversized version of Alaska. If you take, let's say, uh, population uh, individuals from uh, London in the UK, uh, from Lagos in uh, Nigeria, and from Beijing in China, and you ask those individuals, and they're from that area and have been long time, and you ask them to spit in a cup, right? And then you send it off for some sequencing, and you, you do sequencing of non-functional DNA, right? So all humans share 99.9% .9 of their DNA. It's only 0.1% that varies, um, but we can get into that later. Um, and if you look at these sort of SNPs, we can actually say, I can blindly, if you just throw them all out there, I can tell you which of this population belong to the UK group, which belong to the Lagos, Nigeria group, and which belong to the Beijing group, almost at 100%. So they're easy to tell apart, right, genetically, on this small percentage. But wait, if I uh, took a population from, let's say, Beijing, uh, Mumbai, and Jakarta, and I did the same thing, all Asian, I could tell them apart just as easily. And if I took a population from you know, Paris, population from Moscow, and a population from Riyadh, all within the white, just as easy to tell them apart. But wait, don't order yet. If I take a population from Western Africa, Eastern Africa, and Southern Africa, they are more different than any of those other three combinations. There is more genetic variation in Sub-Saharan Africa than the rest of the planet. Human genetics doesn't look anything like this. This is what human genetics looks like. All of the genetics variation outside of Sub-Saharan Africa is a small subset of the genetic variation present in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, this is actually really important. This is what human DNA looks like. This is what human diversity looks like. It's not the way we think about it. Africa's really big, and humans have been there longer. Thus, more diversity. I think that's a really important thing. Genetics does not get us race. Skin color and genetics don't give us white, black, and Asian in any way, shape, or form. Why could you tell those different populations apart? Because they're populations that are far apart. Right? You accumulate different changes in different ecologies in different places. That's, any organism does that. But you can say, OK, skin color and genetics might not get us that. However, in our actual lived experience, we can tell difference. So here we have a picture. I hope you guys can all, can everyone see that more or less? So here we have four individuals. One of these things is not like the other, <laughs> right? This is, in fact, me an extremely long time ago oh, really? in field work, right? And these are three kids in the village that I was staying in. So you can look at this, and even what I said about skin color and genetics aside, you can look at this and you can say, you can tell me where these people are from. So what, what's this guy's ancestry? European. Yeah, right? This is primarily a southern and, and a little eastern European. What about these kids? African. Yeah, dark skin, broad noses, curly hair, right? Totally wrong. They're from New Guinea. <laughs> Your experience is radically, radically insufficient 
to give you an understanding of what humans look like around there. I just told you that dark skin is across the entire equator. So is tight curly hair, so are broad noses, all three of which are not characteristic of all African populations. So what we think about race and skin color and genetics is inaccurate. What we know about it is, but the two are not commensurate. And let me just present to you the Almir twins, two fraternal twins from the UK, same mother and father. What you think you know about genetics and skin color and race is wrong. This is what we know. This is not atypical. Right? One of their father, they're both, their parents are both in, in the UK. One has substantial uh, sub-Saharan ancestry, and the other has ancestry deep in the UK, sort of just in the uh, Anglo peoples of the UK. And there's, they have seven siblings too, and they vary all across the board. What we think we know about human biology doesn't fit. So, um, and here's one, and you can't see this very well right now, but let me just point, point you to this. Uh, uh, Pierre David is an artist, uh, a French artist, who did a wonderful thing called the nuancier. Um, you can't see this very well, but these are 40 individual pieces of wood with different colors. Each of these 40 pieces of wood represents one man from one barrio, one small place in Salvador de Bahia in Brazil. From the same community, the same people, 40 different skin tones in this tight, small community. What we think we know about race and biology is wrong. What we do know is right, and it tells us that race is not biology. However, right, so there's no way that biology divides humans into three or five measurable units. In fact, everything I was just talking to you about earlier, we are one subspecies, Homo sapiens sapiens, all those other ones. So there used to be maybe in another subspecies of humans, Neanderthals, I would argue, were Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. There used to be two races, maybe three, maybe four. There's one right now. There's one. Um, so race as we use is not a biological unit, but race and racism can become biology. So for example, and I'm not going to belabor this, but health variables, testing performance, mortality rates, business, and real estate opportunities vary by race in the United States. Um, the infant mortality rate per 1,000 births in the USA is the 6.39 average, 5.29 for white, 12.4 for blacks. We rank in the low 60s in infant mortality globally if we take African Americans only. Criminal, injustice, but based on race. Biological outcomes based on race. And, and, and there's, uh, I, I encourage people always to go take a look at something called the Race Implicit Association Project at Harvard. Um, you'll have these, there's a, a website for it. it over three, nearly three million people now have taken this implicit racial bias test, demonstrating that no matter what your age, what your background, what your religious affiliation, what your public, uh, political affiliation is, you are biased by existing in the context of the United States, that you have a moderate to greater bias in favor of white relative to other individuals. It's a very fascinating test. Take a look at it. It sets a stage. It sets a context. So race, while not biological, none of this is sort of this natural validity. It is a created reality that has huge and significant impact. So what's the point of that? Um, well, race is all of these things. So understanding them is incredibly important. Um, bottom line, race as we use it, as a term in classification is not a reflection of biological groups. Therefore, the pattern differences that occur between what we call races are not caused by inherent biological differences in these races. They are due to social, historical, political, economic, and experiential context. And they are changeable. The way we use race in the United States has not always been the same. Ask the Irish. Okay. Ask Catholics. Right? Why was Notre Dame started? It's because we weren't allowed to go to the Ivy schools. That's a very important component of it. So the way in which we discriminate and create these unjust, inequitable processes is malleable. That means the way we have our problems today is not fixed. It is not biological. It is not natural in the sense of inherent in our ecologies and histories. Right? So I, I think that's an actually an important contribution from the literature in human biology. Now, I'm going to totally switch gears and briefly make an argument that, at least from an anthropological perspective, and I'd like to think from a theological perspective, but not being a theologian, I probably don't know what I'm talking about, um, that thinking about our deep history over the last two million years, or better put, last 500,000 years, can help us think about what it means to experience 
faith, belief, and hope. Um, I want to read these quotes from Wenzel von Heustein, the, the theologian uh, formerly of the Princeton Seminary. Humans are first of all embodied beings, and as such, what we do think and feel is conditioned by the materiality of our embodiment. There is a naturalness to religious imagination and the human quest for meaning. In looking back to the distant past, how, one, how does new meaning come to be? And in doing so, how does interpretation enable us to reconfigure often long forgotten meanings of the past? I think these are both very important things. But let me also point out that it's not just imagining that's important for humans, but also dreaming. A Reverend Martin Luther King, in his famous I Have a Dream speech, laid out clearly our capacity to hope, our desire, our creativity to imagine a future where race and racism were not at the center of our society. And, and it's horrible and unfortunate that here we are so many years later uh, and it has still not come to pass. But the capacity to hope for that, to dream for that, is a critical component of humanity. I would like to suggest that in thinking about religious practice and religions themselves, uh, we have to think about an evolutionary context. Uh, things did not just appear full-blown in the world. So the question of the origin and capacity to have religious belief might not hold lightly, hold, lie wholly in religious beliefs or structures themselves. I know this might sound weird to seminarians because um, you're focused on particulars of a particular history. But as an anthropologist, I'm looking around the world, and I find that everywhere, all humans believe. All humans have deep faith. All humans have ritual practices. And as a scientist, it, you're like, well, when you find these kinds of patterns, it strikes you. There, there's something really interesting here. And then when you look at the fact that we are the only of this broad cluster of related things to have made it, you start to wonder, well, is there a correlation between this incredible human capacity for hope and imagination and one of the, the reasons that we're still here. Um, so I think we can gain some insights from human evolution, uh, evolutionary history. Now, let me first of all point out, I am not in the evolution of religion camp. There's actually a whole field of study that are mostly cognitive scientists and evolutionary psychologists that see religion, see that all humans participate in some form of religion or ritual practice of faith and belief and say, well, it must have evolved for some function. Right? There must be some reason for it. Now, a common argument is that it's an adaptation that enables humans to organize large groups. Right? Ara Noren Zion wrote a book called Big Gods recently. The basis the Abrahamic faith showed up because it allowed us to organize big groups together to like, plant a lot of things and go to war and control stuff. Um, OK. Um, uh, uh, other people, uh, cognitive scientists, have argued it's a byproduct of our cognitive complexity. Our brains and the social complexity in which we exist is so much that we create what we call supernatural agency detection. Um, we think so hard and reflect on things so much that we attribute we have to attribute stuff to supernatural agents. And that's just a byproduct of how complicated we are. OK? Um, evolved universal uh, features of human cognition constrain certain aspects of religious belief and behavior, say that because of the way our brains and bodies are, we can only have certain kinds of uh, religious belief and behavior. That's what people argue. Other people say that it's basically a uh, adaptive complex of traits, basically that religion emerges from being human, and it's a way to sort of coordinate and, and reflect that humanity. OK, um, that all might be the case in some ways. I really think one of the biggest problems with almost all of these explanations is they never actually talk about people. Uh, they never actually talk about faith and what it feels like and how individuals and groups and communities experience these things. They always talk about what it's for, uh, which is, to me has always struck me as a weird way to think about uh, religion. Um, so um, from an anthropological and evolutionary sense, you know, the question of the origin and capability to have religion, to participate, in, in, in faith practices and rituals might not lie wholly in specific religious beliefs or structures or institutions as they are today. That, that there might be some other things that we can think about in order to understand these processes. Again, I realize this is probably not a common discussion in seminaries, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, so again, we have to explain the challenge of human evolution, explaining how do we get from organisms two million years ago who can make these incredible stone tools to do this incredible imaginative representation to building the world as we see it today. Right. And I would like to argue that, well, part of that, as I've told you, part of that has to do, especially with the way in which we perceive the world to be, the way we hope and imagine the world as it can be, and the way we act together to create that. The capacity to make our imaginations reality, to work together, to change, to, to improve the world, to be good in the world, 
It's actually a very impressive capacity that humans have, and I think it's, it's an incredibly important place to, to ask questions. So, the uh, <clears throat> anthropologist Maurice Bloch, French anthropologist, wrote an article back in uh, 2009 with a somewhat humorous uh, title, um, uh, Religion, uh, re I say, something, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I forget what it is, but something like religion specifically is not important, but is ubiquitous. His argument was that a lot of people talking about religion focus explicitly on the structures or institutions of particular historical tradition and don't actually think about what are the common patterns and practices experiences that characterize humanity. And he made the argument that, that this, this evolutionary process over the last two million years is the one of humans going from social complexity and transactions between individuals, from transactional beings, to being beings who are both transactional and transcendent. That, that a transcendent reality is a component of our, our, our engagement. I recently published a, an article on the evolution of imagination and meaning where I argued that human niche, social relationships, landscapes, and abiotic, and abiotic and abiotic elements are embedded in experiential reality that is infused with a potential for symbolic meaning derived from more than the material substance or milieu at hand. Humans are always infused with meaning. There is no pure materiality. Given that case, it is interesting to ask, how do we in deep past, do we see evidence or any examples of this way of imbuing meaning or being open to meaning in the world that's not just a functional tool. So, so not so much looking at tools that we built for something, but are there any, is there any way we can, we can look at this? Well, turns out, again, I just want to remind you, I am very biased in the context that I think that a key to understanding human evolution is understanding the evolution of community, of the interaction and the reliance on one another, this uh, obligate interdependence that characterizes humans today. So um, how do we seek this in the past, right? We know that cooperation, complexity, and symbol are extremely important for humans. That's the way we do stuff now, but what can we see in the past? Well, and I'm sorry because you can't see a lot of these pictures. I don't know if turning off lights will help, but you will see them, and I will point you to directions where you can see them. How do we look in the past? Well, here's one example. This is a clamshell. It's at least 300,000 years old, found in the island of Java, right? Remember Middle Earth? Um, you guys aren't following that one yet. <laughs> uh, found in the island of Java about 300,000 years ago. It's a kind of clam. This species is no longer in existence, but this genus is very common. That's very tasty as well. Um, so we have evidence of these clams being used by what was probably Homo erectus in that time period. So being crushed and the, the meat being eaten out. This one clamshell. It was collected actually back in the 60s and 70s as part of this collection. And people were going through this collection again to look at sort of stone tool use and figuring out. This one clamshell has this pattern. On. It's sort of, you can see it here. It's got this zigzag pattern carved by a shark tooth. That's, that's my response exactly. Huh. Um, so they've been trying to model this. How can you get this pattern just by wash wear? How, how do you get a shark tooth to do this? Um, the, the sharks didn't eat this. They did not. Something took a shark tooth and basically doodled. I have no idea what this means, but this is very interesting. These are 89,000 year old ostrich shell fragments. They are clearly marked. And in fact, when you put some of these back together from South Africa, when you put some of these back together, they were actually, looked like maybe they were water containers or containers of some sort. You know, ostrich eggs are very, very thick. Um, and we know that people were using them in that time. But 89,000 years ago, instead of just using these ostrich egg shells, they put all these designs on them and marked them. This is a 97,000 year old bit of a scapula from uh, what is today Germany. These are not cut marks. Okay? The actual, the, the, the meat, the rest of the scapula is down here, and the meat actually uh, is up, up in this area. So you don't do this to extract the meat from this bone. Here are a bunch of shell beads. These are a kind of Nasarius shell, a shell that has been used for beads today. 
um, but it's had been used for beads for at least 180,000 years. These are about 128,000 years old. Nasarius also gets this, um, um, uh, uh, what's it called uh, when you get a, a parasite? It gets a parasite, uh, and the parasite drills through it. And what happens is it creates these holes. But what we see in these collections that we find, the holes then have use wear. These were strung on something. The holes were expanded, and then they were strung on something and worn by some one or ones 128,000 years ago. So we see a variety of these kinds of elements deep in our time, deep in our past, none of which are at least, I mean, some might have functions, but they're not sort of the clear kind of chopping meat off a bone. or They don't allow us to immediately, as so I say, to function with them. Thus, the argument is that maybe this is, gives us some insight into a world rich and laden with meaning. I want to point out this here. Everywhere we see, we see cave art starting about 40,000 years ago. And I'm going to show you the oldest cave art in a moment. But almost everywhere we see cave art, this hand outline, it's actually one of the most common. It is the most common if you just take all cave art, the most frequent representation in cave art. It's a fascinating, fascinating reality. And it is quite diverse. They're made by men and women and children. Um, we don't know what this means or why this is, but we get hand outlines tens of thousands of years before we get any faces. So let me walk you through a few things. Here's the famous Blombos Cave, um, Blombos Cave ochre. It's about 80, 79,000 to 83,000 years old. Ochre is a, is a mineral pigment that if you scrape up and then add to some uh, water or heat, you can uh, uh, use it for pigments or as a fastener, as a kind of glue. Um, so we know people were using ochre. Sort of hard to see. Here's the diagram of it. So these aren't scrapes to generate the ochre. These are designs that are placed on these pieces of ochre. And this hash mark design shows up around the planet in cave paintings, on ochre, and on rocks in different time periods, starting about 100,000 years ago or so. Here's the earliest uh, cave painting. Um, you probably can't see it. There's a pig here and a hand here. I'll show you the outline. There's the outline. So here's the pig, right? So can you guys see a little bit of that? And then here's the hand again. I'll show you the outlines again there. Okay. These are 35 to 40,000 years old in Southeast Asia, in, in, um, in uh, uh, what's today Sulawesi. What's critical about this is these are highly well-formed representations. These aren't practice events. That means that they were the people who were doing this were doing this a lot earlier, or at least had practice. And that's another thing. Where did they practice? We never find half-done paintings. But think about what does it, why? Well, this, we think this is, they're calling it a pig deer. We think it's actually a Bobby Rusa. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a Bobby Rusa. They're these beautiful uh, pigs that are these big giant fangs, and the females have these sort of little skinny legs and big bodies, and they run very quickly and taste good. So we think that there was something going on here. But why, why this and this? What is this telling us? This is a, uh, a scapula again, the sort of, you know, the, um, what's the common term for a scapula? Yeah, yeah, a wing or a shoulder blade. Um, so the inside of a scapula, it's very hard to see, but there's a little diagram here. I'm going to show you what that diagram looks like. So this is 128,000 years old, minimally. Minimally. What that's, animal is that from? What is this from? Uh, it's a horse. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in the literature debate over this all the time. No, it's just some scratches that happened, or they were carving the meat off, or... I, it, I'm a little dubious. Um, this looks to me pretty identifiable. I could be wrong. But with all of these things, um, we see some very interesting patterns. So I'm going to sort of wind up here. Uh, Mark Kissel, uh, my current postdoc, and I, in this larger project with the theologian Celia Dean Drummond, are actually combing all of the literature for everything between 40,000 years and 2 million years ago that has been published, recovered and published, that could potentially be a non-functional or a symbolic item. We are developing a database. No one has ever done this. It turns out the other people that have sort of published, they usually publish six or seven. We have 79 sites and hundreds of items, most of which most people had no idea existed. Now, 
the items tend to cluster in certain areas. Part of that is excavations, right, where they happen. Other parts of that might be actual clusters. Um, and they're much more common in the last 100 or 200,000 years ago than they are three or four or 500,000 years ago. But nearly a third of our database is older than 200,000 years. What does that mean? Why is that important? Well, here's the clamshells, right? This is the earliest engraved lines. It's at least 300,000, maybe 600,000 years old. Um, here's the uh, Bekat Ram figurine. This is a fantastic uh, figure from what is today Israel. It's a very human looking stone that was then modified. So the edges were smooth and sort of, we can see the stones were used to remodify it. Um, that's about 380,000, but it's sort of somewhere in the 305,000 year range. The earliest ochre, these pigment use is found in multiple places about 300,000 years ago and pretty much everywhere after that. Um, and you can see a lot of these things that we associate with sort of modern humanity, uh, uh, what you had mentioned, the human revolution, um, all of these things actually have some pretty early dates, most interestingly, before the appearance of us. Homo sapiens sapiens, anatomically modern humans, show up in East Africa about 200,000 years ago. That's our evolutionary history. That's our trajectory from those populations. But almost all of this stuff show after us, it's more and more common. But this capacity for imagination and symbol predates our specific development and emergence on this planet. I find that incredibly interesting. I'm not sure what it tells us. Let me end with this. Sima de los Huesos, 400,000 years ago, uh, a large community of uh, members of the genus Homo, I'm not sure what to call them, uh, lived uh, in northern Spain. And um, excavations have shown uh, 28 individuals Right, the bones of 28 individuals were found in this pit. The only way down into this pit was this small crevice. So you'd have to sort of climb down or sort of throw bodies down to get them down into there. Interestingly, of the 28 bodies, none had carnivore marks. They weren't, they weren't brought there by carnivores. They weren't, the meat wasn't chewed off. They were a little broken from falling in, but not that much. There were little rodent gnaws on there, and there were two cave bears in this uh, collection. Both cave bears had massive trauma to their head and neck. Um, the argument was the cave bears smelled the bodies or something, fell in and Men died. And uh, males and females, 28 males and females and a few kids, right? So in this, and along with those 28 individuals in their bones, we also find this one thing, and you can't see it very well here, but it's a stone tool, beautiful stone tool. It's about this big. It's of this very rare stone found, the closest place where they could have found it was about 40 kilometers away. It is highly worked, incredibly. It's one of the best worked things from this time period. It was never used. So it's found with these 28 bodies. Just this is the only tool with these 28 non sort of chewed on bodies. 400,000 years ago, this group tossed bodies into a very hard to access pit. And then, and you can't see this very well, then they tossed this beautiful stone tool in there. This is the recreation of all of those bodies. This is their community. What did it mean to them? How do we understand this? I don't know, but it's very reflective of very early on as humans were becoming ourselves of a, of a kind of an understanding of a meaning more than just the material and a respect a recognition of there being more than just this. Cooperation and imagination are central in human evolution and I would argue that they are necessary to develop the kind of hope and maybe even faith that we have as humans. It is this incredible capacity to imagine what can be, how the world can be, that allows us to shape how the world is, and I would argue from an anthropological perspective, has facilitated the emergence of what we see today that helps us think through these issues of hope and faith. Thank you very much.